She felt emptied at last, emptied of all life, of all trying and hoping. Then it screamed, a shrill, jerking scream. Dolly was crying. The rubber faces and voices peered down on her, smiling. It's a boy, my dear, a fine boy. He screamed again. Come on, little man, mum needs a rest, they said. But Dolly felt they were wrong. It screamed, not for her, not for her at all. It screamed with anger at the horror of its birth. The idea of generation and the idea of blood tie from parent to child fascinated my mother because that for her encompassed everything. That was, that was humanity. Your blood tie was who you are. Um, how you were conceived, who were the people, how they conceived you. Was it accidental? Was it in the full passion? And the follow-on effect of that was of central importance to and I think that is the basis of the book she wrote called Blood Ties. The actor Rafe Fiennes is the eldest son of the late novelist and painter Jennifer Lash and her photographer husband, Mark Fiennes. It was November 1960 in Warburswick in Suffolk that I first set eyes on on Ginny. She was always called Ginny. She hated the name Jennifer. It was one of those strange moments of absolute certainty in life. And I saw her sitting in the corner of a sofa with her legs curled up. She always sat like, like that. And um, I just knew as soon as I saw her that she, that before she'd even spoken, that she was absolutely the girl for me, the only person that I wanted to live with. She wanted a home. She wanted to be a wife and a mother. She told me practically the second time I met her, she told me she wanted six children. And so eventually we had six children. She used to do little drawings on the back of envelopes or scraps of paper, how she thought her children might look. It was very endearing and made me very enthusiastic. Same idea. <laughs> six children all under the age of seven. I was seven when the twins were born, so the age of seven, I was the eldest of six. Jennifer Lash put a successful writing career on hold to bring up her children, Rafe, Martha, Magnus, Sophie, Jake and Joe. This is a film about their unconventional life together, the blood ties that shaped her life and her work. Me being the youngest, I, I was introduced to this chaotic adventure um, and you were constantly stimulated as a child with crayons and paints and drawings and books and music played constantly and um, so there was a joy in finding your own expression. I think gradually for all of us um, the stimulus of that um, slightly bohemian artistic environment rubbed off. Ginny was passionate about looking after the children so beautifully and caring about them. She had had her second novel published shortly after we were married. And then um, there was a long pause where the children came into the, into the world. And she found painting much more and drawing much more expressive. So eventually she did get to write again, but not until the children were, um, all six of them had been born. I think she made an environment within her own home for her own children where they were stimulated, nurtured, pushed to discuss, to ask questions. We were talked to as adults. She actively discouraged any of us to go to university. She said, if you go to university, you'll be one of those hopeless people who doesn't know what a cabbage is when I asked to go and pick it from the garden. You, know, you, you won't know what a cabbage is, you won't recognize it. You'll be, you'll be so clever that you won't understand anything about the real world. You know, that was, she had a real loathing of 
cold academia. She wrote one very, very powerful children's story called Tristram and the Power of the Light, which was a classic kind of good and evil, a story of good and evil told uh, through a story of a family, a young family. And I think, the, I think that, that the eldest, the boy Tristram, is very much based on Rafe. Tristram, who's quite deep thinking, but uh, urban young boy, is sent off with his cousins who live in the country on a farm, and there's gumboots and mud, and they meet this priest who initiates them into the secret of silencia, which manifests itself in the form of an incredibly intense blue, strong blue light. And with this blue light comes this incredible silence, profound silence. And its opposite force, which is this harsh, aggressive yellow light called cacophraga. And cacophraga comes with noise, a horrendous, jangling, discordant, aggressive, violent noise. And these are the two opposing forces. She would typically draw in the characters of people we knew you'd immediately identify in it. And it wasn't so much a children's story as, as, a, as an incredibly powerful sort of fable. The themes of good and evil, childhood and motherhood dominated Ginny's paintings and her six novels, culminating in Blood Ties, her last work of fiction written in 1987. Set in rural Ireland, Blood Ties is the story of four generations of one family, descended from Violet and Cecil Farr. It is a study of the cycle of damage inflicted on children by parents who have lost the power to love. Blood Ties certainly is about a relationship between parents and children and how just because you're tied by blood does not necessarily mean, not, doesn't follow that love is incorporated into that. The main focus of Blood Ties is Spencer, a child abandoned by his mother and comforted by his grandmother's housekeeper, Maura. Maura very soon had Spencer sitting in the kitchen with a plate of fresh bread and butter and a little scrambled egg and a piece of chocolate cake. Gradually, he began to watch Maura as she busied about in and out of the cupboards, heating things, mixing things, washing things, wiping things. All the time she spoke, it was tireless, gentle talk, like a flow of fresh spring water. It would never have occurred to Maura to think of her deaf gentleness as a particular skill. It was simply the natural way anyone would be with a wounded creature. The character of Spencer and myself, um, the link between the two, I don't think should be sort of underlined too heavily. But there are elements I do identify with. Ginny's dedication to motherhood extended beyond her own six children and prompted her to foster a child in care. I was ironing one day and I, I had the Times propped up in front of me while I was doing all this ironing. And in the personal column of the Times was this advertisement saying, desperately needed, foster home for very disturbed child, must go somewhere where he can read a book. Now, I took that as a message to me. Basically, Jenny said, right, we must give him a home. <laughs> You must have a place to read. Of course the child must read. Um, that was Jenny, you know. When I first arrived at Elm Farm in Suffolk, what amazed me more than anything else was the fact that I just was given a room instead of sharing with lots of other children in care. Having books in your own room, just having tables, you know, a chair, things, you can, things to actually sort of handle, somewhere where you could lock yourself away if you wanted to, your own private space, it just seemed Amazing. <laughs> With Ginny, typically, um, attention to detail was not a problem. I mean, it, 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 the, the complexity of fostering a child and uh, she didn't bother her at all. You know, that was just mere detail. You know, she would just get to it and find a way. She was, I think, brilliant. She was completely clear to us that Mick was not literally our brother, but that he was our brother in the sense that he was now part of the family. She, would, she, never, she never lied. 
I think Ginny's honesty and integrity were of huge value to me. Basically, Mick had lacked that all-important thing called mother love. Like every young animal, you lamb born or calf born, out in the field, you see the mother licking it, loving it, grooming it, caring for it, and if you don't get that, but immediately rejected and not wanted all around, you're damaged. In the homes I'd been brought up in, I don't think I understood what love was. But Jenny, in her own way, just always explained that you know, love is compassion, it's being aware of people, and, and uh, in the end, I think I got there. <laughs> One unique thing, if you like, about Ginny was that she passionately believed in the, the great creativity, and this is a word she would have used, in the process of bringing up children, of rearing, giving birth to, and rearing children. I'm pregnant for the second time now, and I, I desperately miss her input, and I fully acknowledge what she had gone through. Most of my contemporaries struggle with one or two. The input that she gave, and she had six, I don't know how she did it. I think she was quite remarkable. Well, I remember mother and child images being around when I was very young. Well, she reworks it all the time, all the time. Uh, and I think, especially in religious icons, um, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox icons, it was, it was them as, as pictures of mother and child rather than specific religious you know, function of the, the, the picture. My house is strewn with paint, Ginny's paintings of, of, of pregnant women or kind of earth mother type symbols. And I think that, that, it, that a lot of her paintings are a good indication of the fact that ra raising children for her wasn't simply an aside or simply something that happened or was part of family life. I think it was very much an incredible mission for her. When she would fill in forms, you, you know, profession, you know, mother. You know, I'm a bloody mother. It's the hardest, it's a tougher job than you're ever going to see in your life. You know, that was how she saw it. As the children grew older, the Fines ran into financial difficulties. They left Elm Farm and moved 15 times in as many years, buying and selling houses to make ends meet. In the early 1970s, they left England altogether for Ireland. My mother and father went to Ireland. My father had a photographic job there and they fell in love with Ireland with the Irish people that they met and came back saying we believe we should live in Ireland we want to go to the west of Ireland I remember this term being brought up then which is I think it was in vogue then was the term rat race you know, we must get out of the rat race While in Ireland, Ginny took up photography, working with Mark to produce a series of images of vanishing Ireland, which they sold as postcards. She loved people, with a lot of photographs of, of people. This man here, lovely face, the hand, the gesture out. Another great thing that Ginny loved, hands. And speaking of hands, started this series, very original idea, of the hands of people. This was a, uh, an old lady's hands who was a farmer's wife. Lots of hard work and handling animals. Look at that, look at the hand outstretched. Look at the crook of the fingers, just like that. Strong, the outstretched hand like this, a natural gesture. Ginny loved that feeling of the gesture of hands. And here was another card of we had made. We call these pastry hands, because they're little fat, soft, dumpy hands, not at all work-stained like the others. 
with the ring, the wedding ring, the wedding band, the engagement ring. Rather self-satisfied, neat sort of Beatrix Potter, Mrs. Tiggywinkle sort of hands. Children she loved. This picture here, the child. Look at, look at the hand there. The little pudgy paw hanging onto mother's finger and rather sort of cupped by, embraced by the arm when she snuggles up to her mother's side. The little eyes and, and the mouth and the fluffy hair. I think that says everything, holding onto mother's hand. That was typically Jenny. She just really had an eye for that. It was quite, quite brilliant. This photograph I particularly love because it's, I think it's sort of an archetypal view of the gypsy encampment. The smoky fire, the hard life, the sad life, the young girl, pretty then, but the conditions of life can't have been a very promising for her retaining her look. Quite likely in a few years' time she'll begin to look like her granny, stained by life and the strains of life. I think it's just a wonderful, very satisfying picture for the archive. In 1973, they set about building their own home in West Cork, and the whole family spent nearly a year living in temporary accommodation while the house was under construction. We lived in these prefabricated holiday chalets. They were known as the chalets. They were that prefabricated thin wooden plasterboard structure. We lived with another couple, great friends of ours, Mandy and Mark. There was like two girls in bunks with a cot with a twin, two boys in bunks with a cot with another twin, double bed for Mandy and Mark one end, double bed for my mother, for my mother for the other end, in the middle of them with the dogs, two Labradors and a Jack Russell Terrier. In the midst of the chaos and building work, Ginny decided to teach the children herself. All the sort of uh, materials that went into the house became a point of education, you know, volume, mathematics, the component parts of the house and the proportions and everything were a very good practical object lesson for children. Certainly, when we were in Ireland and when she taught us for the spell that she did, she was incredibly inspiring and we always did she had literally had a, this unit of of wednesday afternoon that she'd call making I mean, she literally called it making and that was something in which we all had projects according to our age and that could be doing anything from a project on observing rock pool life <laughs> because there was lots of rock pools on the beach near where we lived or um weather patterns I mean, anything you like, it, you know, the daily life of Mrs. O'Donovan up the road. She really encouraged observation. Our children have had and are having a, a measure of success in all their individual endeavors. And I think the one thing that Ginny instilled in them was a very strong belief that, that if you want to do it enough, and you give it your all, you will, you will do it. And she had one particular expression, you've got to get your guts into it, she used to say. And the children all remember that, you've got to get your guts into it. On the first book she gave me, Mallory's Mort Arthur, I just got totally fired up by it, it was amazing. The first time I was actually going into a book for an imaginative landscape rather than actually inventing it for myself. And it was from there, really, I suppose, from reading Mallory's Mort D'Arthur that I actually sort of started getting into history. And then from history, the next step, a long time later, <coughs> was archaeology. I've fairly recently got some material from Tower Hamlets and it actually says that I had an IQ of, I think it was 79 or 80. Um, Jenny thought this was ridiculous <laughs> and decided that, um, you know, there's a lot more to this child. Um, she always had faith. She always sort of said, don't worry, don't worry. She would take me out drawing into the fields, um, taught me how to sort of draw with sort of charcoal, sketch, um, things I'd never done before in my life. One of Jenny's great strengths was always bringing the best out of people. 
I think she basically just wanted to stimulate all of us. But she encouraged, I, I just so remember once she, she said, let's go to Spain, and I took my Super 8 camera, and we went to observe this incredible festival in Seville called the Feria. We watched the bullfight and I did lots of it on Super 8 and we wanted to film in the abattoir underneath. They cut the carcasses of the dead bull up and it's, this is a very powerful thing and then the, the bull meat is distributed in the restaurants about Seville afterwards and I can just remember going in there and people saying, no camera, no camera. Um, and, and me going, mommy, I better, I better not, I better not film in here. And her going, no darling, go on, go on, go on, film that, film now. And she was just like tapping me with her stick. It was just so sweet because it was just, it was, it seemed to be the embodiment of her encouragement. Go on, no darling, it's fine, it's fine, go on. I wanted to go into the army and I knew that that wasn't an idea that appealed to her. But she said, go, go to the barracks of whatever regiment it was, see what it's like. You know, of course, if it's what you want to do, you must do it. When I came back and from the barracks and whatever, wherever I had had an army visit and said, I don't think this is the life for me, she said, now you know what it might be. It wasn't like I knew I knew I'm right. It was as if, well, I'm so glad you've went and you've seen it and you've known. Music played a, a great part in our lives as children. We grew up listening to a very bizarre sex selection of records, ranging from sort of poetry records to uh, obscure Peter Sellers records and uh, all the kind of great classics. It wasn't, I wouldn't say it was a musical family in as much as there was a lot of disciplined musical tutoring going on there. Or it was a far more sort of um, just general love of, of, of the power of music, of the power, like the power of words, or the power of any, any form of expression. I see another side of her. I mean, to me, she was a, a naturalist, a, an animal lover. I mean, you know, she was, you know, that was she wasn't necessarily arty as far as I was concerned. Anyway, she, you know, ma always had dogs, and uh, and I was all, I kind of bonded with the dogs as well as she did. <laughs> and the only picture I've got of hers is of a dead hare, which actually most people think is sleeping. But I know it was dead, because she had a fascination with skulls and just because it was, it was, you know, it's, the interior was just as, as pretty as the exterior of any animal. So, uh, and she actually gave me, she gave me a stuffed fox and a stuffed weasel for my 16th birthday. So, uh, she understood that was there, and she loved the countryside just as much as I did. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. I think as we all ended into adolescence, it probably got more exhausting. Surrounded by dirty clothes, by smelly adolescent boys, by you know, people always wanting to be fed and it's always the next meal and it's... I mean, all those things were very real, very exhausting. So it's not like it was... It's not like our upbringing was this kind of hippy-dippy, great, lovely, rambling, you know, painting. It was full of, you know, everyday practicalities, domesticity, rows, arguments, slamming of doors, screaming, shut up, leave me alone, you know, the usual stuff that goes on. But I think always within that, she was creative with it. She was creative with her family and she was... I think, you know, Francis Bacon said that if he wasn't a painter, he would have liked to have been a mother. And I, I always think of that in terms of Ginny because she did, approach, she did approach it in that way. She had been someone who was very hands-on domestically and that she did absolutely iron and wash. And I, funnily enough, I think a lot of these references come up in her work like washing on a line blowing in the wind or the sound of scrubbing or the running of water and the filling of a bucket. These kinds of still life images. The domestic ritual is a kind of a sacrament for her. It's, it's really gritty and it's real and it's necessary. And so having family was, uh, you know, very, that's very much part of it. To her, love of the children was an all-important factor. 
she was a product of, of a background lacking in mother love, certainly. And was determined to put it right in her life, not to repeat that mistake. In contrast to the world she created for her own children, Ginny's upbringing was often difficult and unhappy. She was a child of the Raj. Her father, Hal Lash, also known as Binka, was a brigadier with the Royal Gawal Rifles. And her mother, Joan, was the daughter of a high-ranking member of the Indian Civil Service. I don't think she was a sensitive, a truly sensitive person, Joan. I think she was loud and glamorous, very glamorous, their life in India. My, my, I have vivid memories of mummy always describing how being kissed goodnight by her mother would always be a cheat proffered. And um, there was never any sort of contact because she was terrified of getting the lipstick sort of smudged all over her and that there was this sort of glamorous painted face. And, and she had no real emotional contact and she felt far closer to her nanny. I think Ginny was very much Nanny's favourite because the parents d didn't look after the children. I mean, we were taken into the drawing room before we went to bed for an hour or so with the parents, but the, the actual bringing up was left to the Nanny. After the Second World War, the Lashes moved back to England, exchanging a life of glamour and servants for the post-war austerity of suburban Surrey and the struggle to keep up appearances. Ginny's father, Hal, I think he felt that his whole life had been pulled from under him. And I think he never recovered. And I think the whole family entered into a sort of very stagnant, strange, thwarted life. There are certainly observations and details in Blood Ties about the character of Cecil, which I'm sure She's, you know, uh, us, uh, relevant to her own father. And it's really this sadness that this, this, this man whose life is somehow not lived, the life unlived, the unlit lamp, that kind of idea. Violet and Cecil Farr are the loveless parents in blood ties who in turn become cold, detached grandparents. Their lives are empty of any purpose or emotion. Cecil had been invalided out of the army. Violet was the force, the power, the condition under which he lived. She filled the dull space one way or another. He concerned himself with small decisions. Which bag was more appropriate for the market or the picnic? Which toast rack? Which nutcracker? The hall barometer was his only real possession. My parents were very much of their generation, which meant that you didn't show a great deal of public affection, um, which I think was true of them. I think they hadn't, I think it wasn't always easy, their marriage. My mother, like Ginny, my sister, was very temperamental and would um, throw scenes of um, drama, whereas my father was precisely the opposite and would sit there and say, I never argue which meant he didn't, which made him made everything worse. I mean, certainly I think that Ginny as a child was highly emotional. And I think this was threatening to her mother. There, there was a history of mental problems in her mother's family. And when Ginny displayed, you know, hyster hysteria, signs of chronic hysteria, her mother pulled away and was distant from her. Her grandmother, Muriel, suffered from intense um, psychiatric disorder. She had breakdowns. She was institutionalised. And my mother has told me of being in the living room and her grandmother suddenly walking in, naked, covered in leaves and twigs and sort of things from the woods. My mother turned around and just had never forgotten this sight etched indelibly in her imagination. And of course, her grandmother was ushered very quickly out of the room. 
But um, I think Ginny, she might have sensed a sort of facet. This is another world, a world that she was never allowed to be part of, or with the restraint and restriction and the repression of 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 the world that she found so suffocating. Um, never allowed for these demonstrations. The unfulfilled life of her parents and her father, particularly, was such that. He, he sort of used and, and sort of abused her to the point where he, he abused his, his power as a parent and that was the source of a lot of her pain, this sense of being a prisoner. What happened to Ginny was that when she was 16, she locked herself in her room and she just screamed and she just screamed loud and hysterical and that's the same scream of the child in blood ties. Spencer knew he must make the sound, and the sound came. It heaped itself up and out from every scarred inch of him. It rallied all the forgotten emptiness of the small room. The house rung now with nothing but the sound of the howl. The careful, avoiding silence of so many summers was punched into this great spire of sound. I was Ginny's headmistress for one year, and I realized at one moment that she was very near the edge of a nervous breakdown. I was extremely worried about her. So when I read Blood Ties, I found it almost impossible to read. I found it was so distressing. I realized her capacity to enter into the feelings of the battered and abused and destroyed child is sourced in her own experience of pain. I cannot imagine anywhere else that anyone could find that sort of experience and power of expressing it. Ginny escaped the oppressive atmosphere of her parents' home as soon as she could, leaving when she was still only 16. She had that intelligence which could say, I am a vital living soul with an imagination and thoughts and my own sense of independence, and I'm, I'm in an environment which does not allow that. Shortly afterwards, she had a mental breakdown. It was her uncle, a Benedictine monk, who helped her to find the psychiatric care she needed. But I think her teenage breakdown was the absolutely, uh, viewing in retrospect, was the indispensable condition uh, for growth, you know? Uh, I mean, you know, these fairy stories which all start with getting lost in the forest. The, the hero, or heroine, would have been, is lost in the forest. And in Ginny's case, that, her breakdown was precisely that, I think. It, it, it was terribly painful for her, but it was, it was the preparation of a, of, of, of a real journey, I think. When I'm painting, what leads me to so often make the most crucial marks is I could hear myself saying, make the mark where the pain is, where the pain is. And that is how I know what to do. While in therapy, Ginny went to work as a nanny for a woman named Iris Birtwistle in Suffolk. Iris encouraged Ginny to write her first semi-autobiographical novel, The Burial. She who enthused Ginny. In, the, in this area. And suddenly, the east coast of East Anglia with the wide open skies and, and the marshes and the bird calls and the crash of the waves and on the shore, that long, long shore, that gave Jenny a huge sense of freedom and liberation from, from the life that she'd lived. And it was like sort of you know, losing a caged bird in a way. transformation went along two tracks. One track was creative, 
And Blood Ties, of course, was the consummate achievement of that, I think. And the other track was personal, something she became, you know. She became a wonderful woman, a wonderful woman, uh, a wonderful mother, a nurturer. She became more and more herself. She had felt unloved as a child, and then having a huge family was her process of kind of healing in a very natural sort of way. I think Ginny's understanding of motherhood came probably from daydreaming. The mother that she would have loved to have had, and the mother maybe she felt found in literature, maybe she found in her experience of God, in the mothering of God. But when I first met her as a married woman, she came down here for a picnic with Rafe aged about two and, and um, Martha in a caddy cart with Michael looking after them. I felt that here was something which was a tremendous outlet for her creativity and for her power of loving. I think one of the extraordinary achievements in Blood Ties is that there is a sense that you can compensate, that human nature has the capacity to compensate for very great pain and very great ill. And this is what it is about. It's about the sen a sense of hope in the end, after harrowing, harrowing times, a sense of the possibility in every human being to make that leap of achievement. After her own children were born, Ginny tried hard to heal the rift with her parents and to help them to be loving grandparents. I know that my mother badly wanted to make up with her mother. Um, I have memories when I was about 16 of her talking openly to her mother about the past and wanting to, in some ways, heal that rift and problem um, without burying it. But my mother was incredibly forgiving and, and that was very important to her. She didn't sort of cut herself off and say, you know, I, I, I never want anything to do with my mother who was the cause of such great unhappiness. And, no, she was terribly human like that and really had a great understanding of human nature. Ginny isn't judgmental about the maternal relationship that has gone sour because she understands how difficult it is. She understands how hard it is. Because as a woman, you're a person in your own right. And then suddenly, you're having to give up your, yourself for this, these new people. The character of Violet in Blood Ties, unlike Ginny, finds no joy in her young son. Violet seemed unable to sustain the calm, loving presence required of her. Lumsden's dribbling irritated her. His ears maddened her. They were ugly, unruly flaps, giving her son the appearance of a bizarre sea creature. And then there was the puffy lower lip which slopped forward, a great damp droop of red whenever he concentrated. Please, Nurse Biddy, get him to close his mouth, Violet would say again and again. He's not catching flies. See, the thing about Violet, who's this, this central matriarchal figure in Blood Ties, who is not, as we would say, a good mother. She doesn't give love to her only son. But we, we, we the reader, through Ginny, are privy to the terrible sense of loss and unfulfillment in Violet. Ginny herself struggled to fulfill the demands of creativity and motherhood. I think Ginny found it quite exhausting being the person that she was, being so many things to so many people. There's a poem that she wrote that I think is very powerful where she talks about my freedom has been spilt and poured into each child's need. I think she certainly felt that. She certainly felt dismembered almost by the process. She uh, had a terrifying temper. 
and she could fly off the handle um, um, and become someone completely different. Um, but you knew that it was, she was constantly struggling with something and it, I think always her anger would come out of a situation where she needed space and quiet and it um, just became too much for her, whether it was people shouting and fighting while she was trying to write or um, constant bickering or something. But, but there was a reason and I think the reason was maybe an infringement on her, her space that she just was constantly trying to etch out for herself. It was interesting the times when I think, you know, the family she had had, the thing that she, the, the, the seven human beings she had nurtured were what she valued most. And at the same time, the fact that what she valued most was the thing that maybe stopped her from another kind of life. In some respects, she was always looking forward to this point whereby the children were gone and then she could indulge 100% in, in, in her creative processes. Um, but I, I, by the time that happened, she had, she, she had cancer, you see. All the cancer began, began to set in, which, which meant she never really had a period of time to write and paint. Blood Ties was finished after her first operation for cancer, and she spent as much time as she could in a little cottage in Suffolk, surrounded by her books and treasured possessions. Junior never loved living in London, never liked London particularly. She always found it strange for her. She found the air was bad for her breathing, particularly when she got cancer. And she found it was balm to the spirit. She loved the slow pace of the country. She loved the sound of the birds in the morning. She loved the light on the corn and the trees in the autumn. Um, to her, it was a haven. During her illness, she started to explore new religious avenues, reaching beyond traditional Catholicism and finding solace in a variety of spiritual experiences. All through her life, I think her faith was the most important and passionately illuminating part of her life. She was never a conventional, pious child, but she was a thinker and a feeler, and she truly sought God, and I believe had a very deep experience of him. In 1989, she was commissioned to write a non-fiction book about pilgrimage, and despite her illness, set off for the holy sites of Europe. She saw her cancer not as a handicap, but as a source of strength on what was to be an inward as well as an outward journey. Poor cancer, she wrote. The word is dark and terrible, full of fear. I believe it is a constellation. You become simply one of thousands and thousands of stars within it. A star may be sharp and full of pain, but it may also be a guide, a useful companion on a dark night. On Pilgrimage, it's subtitled A Time to See. It's an account of her going to France to various ancient medieval centers of pilgrimage and then ending up in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Often these places were very Roman Catholic, but that wasn't the point. It was the humanity of the experience of going there, the, of the, the simple humility of some of the people that she encountered that in turn in Im Im implied an enabling for loving and forgiving and for acceptance. When she returned from her pilgrimage, Ginny was deeply frustrated to discover that blood ties had been rejected by her publisher. She saw it as a dismissal, not just of the ideas in the book, but of the beliefs by which she had lived and brought up her children. Ginny spent a long time working on blood ties, a lot of research, She'd researched postnatal depression extensively. She had developed the characters over a long period of time. It was a novel that was in gestation for several years. And when it was rejected by her publisher, she was devastated. Ginny was very confrontational. She wanted the truth. There were no hidden agendas. She'd always want to talk it out. People didn't like her paintings. She wanted to talk about it. If they didn't like her writing, 
so long as they was, it wasn't mean and destructive, she was prepared to discuss it. But to have her, she thought, her best and latest work of fiction rejected was like an arrow to Ginny's heart. She felt like a woman who had given up 30 years of her life to rear family. But when she completed this piece that she'd spent so long on, when she completed Blood Ties and it was rejected, she felt like she was just this disposable, white, middle-aged, middle-class woman who had no place in the world of making work. When Ginny died of cancer in 1993, Blood Ties was still unpublished. But a chance conversation between her son Rafe and the novelist Michael Ondaatje was to change the book's fate. I met Michael Ondaatje, and I was filming English Patient, and I talked to him about Ginny, and I told him about the existence of Blood Ties, and he suggested to Liz Calder from Bloomsbury Publishing that maybe she would read it. I had a reaction, which I think I've never had before in reading a book. I've, I've often been moved, and indeed moved to tears, uh, reading manuscripts, but with this one, at, at the very end, I literally burst into tears, and this was, you know, <laughs> a shock to me. I knew that this book had to be published, and that we had to publish it. When Liz Calder read it and said how instantly moved she was by it, that was always the response that I had hoped Ginny would witness when she had written it and was alive. I think this book represented something that came not only out of her writing self, but out of her, her, her personal experience, both with her family, her own family, and with her parents. I suspect that its time has come in a, in a funny way now. Here at the end of the 90s, there is perhaps a willingness to be more emotionally open. And I think the emotional response it gets in readers is to do with that mixture of pain and love and hope. In a strange way, I always feel that I would never have got to a position maybe to have two, two children. But I just see Jenny as actually giving me that opportunity, and Mark, but Jenny in particular in a way that she's nurtured me, showing me that I can love, that I can feel love from others. And at the end of the day, that I am a loving parent. It's only now, with the benefit of hindsight, after Ginny's death, that it's possible to see the journey of her life. Because she didn't know where she was going. She was feeling her way in the dark. She was going on her gut instinct, really. But now, suddenly, when it's all over, you can see the beginning and the end, and then you see the shape of her life. And you can see the great achievement that it was, having somehow liberated herself from the repression and the pain that she felt as a child. A couple of occasions I remember her saying, the fundamental thing is love. Love is the most powerful thing there possibly ever is. Anything that engenders, encourages a situation, an environment of love and loving and receiving an exchange of love, that for me is, is all that matters. That, was, that is was sort of her basic thing.